So today we're talking to Professor Anne Oakley, who really doesn't need any introduction. Um, and the themes of our conversation are going to be on um, a lifetime of research. Um, we're going to be asking around um, the impacts and enduring legacy um, of your research, but also that longer term legacy um, of, of, of the work that you've done. Um, so our first question um, picks up on that, which is um, what, what for you uh, has been the most important strand of re research in, in your career? Well, I obviously have to say gender. <clears throat> I don't obviously have to say gender, but I, that is the case because I started out and I think what I am in some circles best known for is the work I did on the differentiation of sex and gender, which was a very long time ago. I mean, the work that I did for that was over 50 years ago. And Sex, Gender and Society was published in 1972. Now, I didn't embark on that as a, a major research project. I was actually doing um, a study of housework and I was genuinely puzzled as to why it was women worldwide who did the housework. So that sent me to the anthropological and medical and um, psychological literature to look at um, the answer, to look for the answer to this question. And what I discovered with this whole complex system of, of gender differentiation, which, um, in which, for the most part, women are treated unfairly, but not always. And that's what, that's what I found, so that's mm. why I wrote that book. And that, I know, that book has, has stayed in print. Yes. And it is used by A-level students. Yeah. You know, I get... Yeah maybe one email a week from really? a student saying, could you just explain to me this? <laughs> and often they want me to do the work for them and I yes. tell them to go and read the book. <laughs> <laughs> and that doesn't go down very well. So, um, so it's, it's the, the gender system. And then obviously uh, my work on housework, yeah. uh, I think has helped to elevate the status of of housework, um, both as an academic subject and as an area of, of, of labour. Um, and that is, I, I know that is also quoted um, quite a lot and has, it, 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 some of that work has been read by quite wide areas of the public. It, yes. it hasn't actually been just sort of academic theory. Yes. Um, and then the third area I th uh, is methodology. Yeah. yeah. So I think the way in which my work has used um, different approaches um, and, um, and has been at times quite controversial for doing that. Uh, I would like to think um, that I have had some uh, made some contribution to the evolution of social science methodology. Um, you know, most recently, well, I say most recently, but actually since the mid-1990s, setting, um, setting up a resource for doing systematic reviews of social research, I think, yes. and that continues yeah. today, and I'm very proud of my role in helping that off the ground. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just going to follow up a little bit. Why do you think it was so controversial that you, you were using, like, systematic reviews for social research? What, what do you think was... Um, controversial in that for people? I didn't think it was controversial, no. but uh, the academic, parts of the academic community yeah. didn't, didn't yeah. respond particularly well. Yeah. Um, particularly, I have to say, in education, there were professors of education who got quite cross when, you know, it wasn't this, this work I didn't do on my own, this was no. very much a team effort, but when we came along and said, um, about an area of education research, you know, we read these studies, we can't tell who you interviewed, who they were, when you did it, what questions you asked them. Yeah. So we, it, was, it was, you know, more a question of taking them to task for not reporting their research yeah. in such a way that you could work out whether or not it answered the question that you were trying to answer. Yeah. So it was a, yeah, we were, I think, regarded as being unnecessary, unnecessarily pernickety about that, but it isn't a question of unnecessary pernickety or whatever the word is. It's 
this is a you know a, a really important criterion about yes. the doing and reporting yeah. and dissemination of research results. Yes. So uh, that's uh, I was surprised. I was surprised. Yeah. Not so much by the, the controversial um, aspect, but by the hostility. Hostility. I remember going to conferences and presenting these results and just being shouted down. Yeah. Right. And it didn't happen, of course, well, not of course, but it didn't happen when we were talking to healthcare audiences because yeah. the notion that you need to look at an area of research properly and you need to be sure that you have evaluated something in such a way that you can be confident that you're yeah. saying this works or this doesn't work. That is much more accepted in healthcare settings. Yeah. It is not, was not, and still is not accepted in the same way in settings outside that. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you think that kind of those responses are reflective of the, the discipline at the time, the people who are publishing in those areas and developing methods in those areas? I don't know, because some of that response continues today. Um, I know, I mean, <laughs> I am not in that world in the same way that I was, but, but I know from talking to colleagues that it does. Um, and, you know, <laughs> um, you don't have very much control over how people read your work. Um, and people read other people's work in such a way that makes sense to them at the time. I do it. We all do it. So I can see that some of what I was saying about methodology didn't fit with what people wanted to hear. Right. And they didn't actually take the trouble to understand it. I mean, the degree of misunderstanding, we're going to come on to this later, but some of my uh, applications, particularly to what was in the Social Science Research Council, the peer reviewers' comments about methodology reveals an appalling level of ignorance about these different methods. And I really was appalled that there were other people who were part of that yeah. effort to get that work funded. Yeah. 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 That's that's really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Well we'll we'll come on to that question, I think, straight away, which is um, what what parts um, or what funding applications were unsuccessful? So, in it were they those applications where you got such ignorant um, feedback and comments, or such um, lack of understanding of what it was that you were doing? Um, yes. Well, every social researcher has a whole filing cabinet full of unfunded research. <laughs> And it, well, you know, <laughs> yes, you 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 <laughs> have to. Yeah. And when you know, when I look back at uh, however many years I I was doing this, I, I am amazed by the amount of time, see, the amount of labour that goes into yeah. this. It is a very inefficient way of of conducting a research enterprise nationally. I think. Um, and it, it is it is all, also speaks to something which is a theme throughout my career, which is the lack of a proper career structure for research. Uh, social research is still the poor, and, uh, we're not even called academics, you know, there are academics and then others, and researchers are others. Um, you can get a, a permanent contract to be a, a teaching, to have, be a, a member of the teaching staff, but not to be a member of the research staff. And that means that researchers are constantly chasing the next contract. And that has all sorts of implications for the way in which research is done. Um, and one of the implications, which again we may come on to later, is that the attention to research materials when a project is over, there is no attention. They get, stuff gets shoved in a cupboard, right? Yeah. And it never gets sorted, it never yeah. gets looked after. So the public money that goes into research yeah. <laughs> is not reflected in, at the end of the day, in the public resource that other researchers can access. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. So unfunded, I mean, I think in the end, I try to think of a, a, a project that I, I couldn't get funded, and I actually wasn't able to think of anything that I didn't eventually manage to get funded. But that might mean seven or eight different applications, yes. you know? And yes. I used to reckon that one application 
even if it was quite a sm for quite a small amount of money, it would take you a month. And so that is a lot of time spent yeah. trying to chase funds yeah. for something. Yeah. I think I would have liked to have done more comparative research, looking at other countries, looking at the international context for some yeah. of the issues that I've looked at. Um, yeah. I, I would have. Uh, I would have wanted to, to do that. Yeah. What do you think that would have added to your research? Uh, well, I would. It would have been fascinating to have, for example, uh, done the housework study yeah. in 19, early 1970s in other countries. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it would uh, some of the work later on looking at. Um, I mean, we did a project on um, uh, evaluating the, the value of childcare, uh, formal childcare, uh, and of course, Scandinavian countries have a, a wealth of experience of that. So to have done the same study, I mean, this is, this is I hesitate to say this, but this is in a sense the medical model. It's when you're tr trying out an intervention, you look at it in lots of different places. Yeah. And I think social yeah. uh, science really hasn't got its head around that. Yeah. Uh, and that would have been, in terms of producing a social science which is relevant to social policy, I think that is what you need to do. And you, it needs to be an international context. Yeah. That's really helpful. And just finally coming on, so at the beginning of the first question was looking at the themes that have been taken forward and yeah. have been really impactful. Are there any themes in your work that have not been taken forward, that perhaps have surprised you, that they've not been taken up? Well, I think some of the work has been taken up in some circles and not in others. So yeah. the book that I wrote about the history of methodology, experiments and knowing, yeah. I know is very widely used by healthcare researchers. Mm -hmm. I would like it to be used by people who are learning how to do sociology yeah. mm -hmm. um, more than it is. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I think there is a... Um, a piece of work that I did in relation to the um, study of women having their first babies. Yeah. Um, I published a book. I published two books about that. One was called Becoming a Mother, and it was uh, reprinted under the title From Here to Maternity and reviewed by some people twice. They thought it was a different book. It shows yeah. you how well they read it in the first place. <laughs> but the second book was called Women Confined towards the sociology of childbirth. And what it put forward was a theoretical model for explaining postnatal depression. Right. Um, and what I argued on the basis of these interviews which I had conducted with women over during their pregnancies and afterwards, um, what I argued was that you didn't need to have any kind of theory about women's psychology to understand that some women having a first baby got quite miserable afterwards. They had gone through a series of traumatic human, human life yeah, events, yeah. occupational yeah. change, uh, complete change in bodily shape and bodily identity, yeah. um, taking on a new job with no training at all, yeah. uh, and surgery often as well institutionalisation in hospital and all of this yeah. was sufficient to explain why that you know you weren't necessarily overcome by the joys of motherhood. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that has not been taken up yeah. and I don't know why yeah. uh, and I think it's a loss because I, yes. I continue to think that that is a valid yeah. But I think it's a useful. I think it's a useful way of looking at Absolutely. it, and I think it would be more helpful in some cases for some of the women who still, you yeah. know, have this yeah. kind of difficulty. Yeah, yeah, Absol yeah, absolutely. It's, it links back. I think what's, what's really interesting about that is you know what's seen as controversial, um, and I do wonder if um, sort of topics like that, which you know are part of the lived experience of at least fifty percent of the population, yeah, yeah. Um, are actually not been um, taken seriously by broader disciplines, by funders, you know, yeah. by, by those who um, fund social research. Oh um, yes, that's a, that's a yeah. theme that goes all the way along. Mm -hmm. I should have mentioned earlier in relation to the first question that I think the work, the, the motherhood work, yeah. um, the early work, um, drew attention to the impact of medicalisation, which is what yeah. it was then called. Yeah. And I, what that was part of was a move 
mostly outside academia, but some within, and there were other sociologists who, who around that same time were, particularly in America, Barbara Katzroth and Nancy Stollershaw, people like that, who were saying the same thing. This helped to change maternity care policy. Yes. Mm. Yeah, not just yeah. here, but everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it helped to alert um, people to the fact that quite a lot of what was done to women who were having babies was yeah. not based on good evidence and yeah. was actually harmful. Yeah. Uh, and it, I think it empowered, it's not a word I like very much, but you sometimes need to use it, it empowered the um, user organisations to yeah. bring about change. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's really interesting in the context of research that I'm currently doing around young fatherhood. Um, yeah. So we're working with, with professionals and practitioners and we're talking about the benefits of father inclusive practice, um, not just for men, but for women and for children as well. Um, and I was just wondering if you could reflect a little bit about, um, you know, why might we need to ask questions about men and their welfare? And um, do you think that contributes to that broader conversation and discussion around um, the challenges that women experience as well? And, mm. you know, women's, well, questions of women's welfare. Well, gender is not just about women, although it is mostly women who go on about it, which I think <laughs> is a problem. Mm. So gender is about men. Mm. Um, and if one is looking at the impact of cultures of gender ideology and practices on human beings, you have to look at the impact on men. Um, and so, you know, fatherhood is a very, it's a good example. It's an area where I think men suffer from being excluded to some degree from experiences of love and care mm. which are deeply meaningful human experiences so which women get probably rather too much of but, but that is a, an area where uh, men would definitely benefit but th this whole thing about gender being about women is such a problem so um, you know, if you look at if you look at social policy issues today, one of the biggest problems is the culture of masculinity. I done some work on this with um, a colleague called Cynthia Coburn. We wrote some uh, piece in the Guardian and in various other places. Uh, looking at the culture of masculinity and, and masculinity as why masculinity is not a social policy issue. So you look at uh, crime. Uh, over 90% of violent crime is committed by men. Um, one of my um, social science heroes, heroines, is a woman called Barbara Wooden, who uh, did a lot of work on um, the treatment of, of crime, criminology, um, criminal justice. And she made this remark along the lines of, if men be behave like women, the courts would be idle and the prisons empty. Mm -hmm. That remains true. So if you want to save, I think Cynthia and I did a calculation that if men, uh, this was about uh, 10 years ago, if men behave like women um, in terms of crime, £42 billion pounds a year would be saved. Right. Right? Yeah. You could yeah, spend yeah. that usefully. Or, yeah, quite usefully. So, right, so <laughs> why do people... Not, this is not about... Yeah, I mean, our piece in The Guardian got a lot of responses along the lines of man-hating, man-baiting oh, yeah. and all that. Yeah. yeah. Why? It's always women who are the problem. So the Ministry of Justice publishes an annual report on women in the criminal justice system, which is to fulfil the requirements of some Equality Act. They um, don't do a report on men in the criminal justice system, because if they did, it would be policy dynamite. Because what it would show is, yeah. is what I've just said, that yeah. you know, a, a major area of social policy that needs attention is the um, antisocial effects of a culture of masculinity and it, its impact not just financial but obviously psychological and social. Yeah. I don't think that was the answer you were expecting. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I think it raises more questions for me, I think, which is great. And, you know, for me, I, I suppose um, I'm trying to look at, at fatherhood and people's everyday lives. And yep. um, I guess my question then is, is what's our role as sociologists in developing those explanations? Um, and what can we do, I think, to, to um, 
contribute to those broader discussions um, in a way that benefits men as well as women, I think, in society. I don't think I can answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's for you, younger um, generation. generation. <laughs> I'm afraid. I pass yeah. that one back to you. Yeah. It's difficult. It is difficult. It's difficult yeah. to change. Mm -hmm. You know, Cynthia and I, we managed to get um, an interview with Jon Snow. Um, yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. He was very nice. We met for coffee somewhere near ITN. And he, he was very engaged with the whole topic. But he said, you know, the problem is it's not newsworthy. <laughs> it's not um, newsworthy. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. 42 billion isn't Yeah, it's not newsworthy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, interesting. That is, a, yeah, that is interesting. Which is, but then that's, that comes back to why certain themes of your work have endured and uh, others may not have yeah. around um, not only in terms of whose interests they may serve, which is one touches on your question that you, you know, who's writing at what time and for. Mm what set, sorts of purposes and for whom, but also then what, what is seen as provocative and why is, why is motherhood, why, why is this example of, of women saying, actually it wasn't good for me in hospital mm. when I was having children and I was being infantilised in, yeah. in particular yeah, ways, yeah. Which, which wasn't great. Mm. Um, why, why that push back against um, an orthodoxy, like a medical orthodoxy becomes very pro provocative in those sorts of situations, so... Well, I mean, the answer... Uh, one answer to that is obviously if you start saying that motherhood isn't necessarily, um, you know, a matter of joy and roses and all of that, you are, um, you are criticising, you are trying to... you are taking apart a really Im important cultural ideology that keeps the whole kind of gender family system in place yeah. so you're you're corroding that yeah. and that is threatening to yeah. the establishment and in terms of medicine you know in the 70s um <laughs> I, I hesitate to compare that with the situation today but um, doctors were very patronizing um, they really did. It yeah. wasn't just women that they <laughs> treated in this infantilised way. You know, patients didn't have rights, patients didn't have experiences mm -hmm. that you needed to listen to. Yeah. Um, and that has, that has changed, but yeah. it was uh, in a process of transition. Yeah. 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 Thank you. One thing I so again, one thing I'm interested in is kind of the extent to which we individualise families still um, and that lets the state off the hook I think in lots of ways um, you know actually providing um, access to resource and, and welfare and, and you know I think we, we sort of expect families to carry a, a huge part of the load of, of the whole range of social problems and that gets sort of talked about at a discourse level as well I think and yeah. um, I certainly see my role in, is in trying to develop those explanations really around um, yeah that, that's problematic <laughs> yeah um, and within families, it's still women mm -hmm. who carry the main burden of sorting all of this out. Mm. Not exclusively, but um. still a lot. Um, we, we've mentioned which were the most impactful at the time. Why do you think that your work continues to have mm. such significant impact? Because it does. It's, it, it's, it's, it continues to have important and resonance for sociologists social scientists more generally yeah. and, clearly, and clearly young people as well um, as you were yeah. saying yeah yeah yeah. Mm. yeah yeah and student i mean you know they're coming back to you they're, they're engaging and that there's still so much meat for them to engage in mm. um, and resonance with their own lives and yet we're talking for me i think there's a couple of things here which is around this idea or well, 1975 this is the students that are writing to you um, that's very much in the childhoods of their own parents, probably, yeah. likely. Um, so for me, that has a, 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 um, that raises questions around enduring social trends, enduring social processes. Um, uh, yeah, and that also then connects to um, why you th why some of your work does continue to have and which ones do you feel are the most important that have that continue to have resonance for people i think the question about impact is better answered by other people but mm -hmm. i will give you two answers okay <laughs> um one of them is that i think a great deal of my work has been about everyday life it's just been about the living of everyday lives mm -hmm. and that is something that 
people find it relatively easy to identify with. Mm -hmm. And in relation to that, um, you know, my orientation, I hate to say this, but I don't actually hate to say it, it's the truth, has not been pr predominantly towards the academic world. I have not been trying to become a sociological theorist. Um, I wasn't trying to become a professor at an early age. Those were not my ambitions. And therefore, I think that I probably have a reputation as quite a practical kind of sociologist, somebody who doesn't write in a theoretical, jargony kind of way. It's accessible, and I've always tried to yes. write accessibly. And that is related to the fact that I never wanted to be a sociologist in the first place. I just wanted to be a writer. <laughs> so, so yeah. writing and tran the translation of research into some kind of uh, text that makes sense to people outside yeah. that world has been always been very important to me. Yeah. But also those themes endure as well. So whilst we've seen tremendous social change since 1975, we, those themes still endure, they're, they're absolutely at the heart, as you say, of human experience, yeah. you know, motherhood or, or parenthood or housework, home, family, these, these, mm. uh, the most profound of human connections, yeah. really, mm. um, yeah, and, and the I'm, most immediate yeah, to our everyday lives, they're fundamental yeah. to mm. what we And we, we the, the Becoming a Mother project was, we did do, but very much helped, led by other people in this unit. Um, a follow-up study, uh, contacting some of the women who were yeah. originally interviewed and re-interviewing them. And then we did, we repeated the methodology with another sample. And now uh, there are uh, a couple of, well, a team of researchers who are going to try and get money. <laughs> probably spending months and months writing an unfunded research <laughs> uh, to get money to do another yeah. such study. So, yeah. you know, that tells you <laughs> that, that those themes and that kind of approach uh, is still, still has resonance today. Yeah. So, Anne, in, when you were talking about gender earlier and you were talking about men, um, you touched slightly on masculinity and I wondered if you wanted to say a little bit more about that. Yes, what I want to say about that is that, the, the, uh, as I said before, the gender system is about men and women. And uh, really, the, the, the current culture of masculinity um, is, is, I think, very difficult for men. I think it's health damaging. Um, it helps to explain one of the enduring mysteries in, in all of this, which is why on the whole, men have a higher mortality and morbidity than women. Um, that may very well be something to do with the expectations of male behaviour and, you know, emotional life, or rather the lack of it, <laughs> uh, and all that, that, that kind of, um, all those uh, related areas. Uh, so if you're looking at inequalities in health, there has been so much more work done on structure, class structures than on gender and inequalities in health. Yes. And I, I've done some work with a public health expert called Alex Scott Samuel about the fact that patriarchy is damaging to men's health. Mm -hmm. uh, I think some, this is a really important point, yes. you know. Yeah. <laughs> if one is looking as a social scientist at this whole picture, this is part of the picture. We aren't just talking about poor women and the oppression of women. We are talking about the oppression of human beings yes. mm -hmm. by a divisive and um, unhelpful way of thinking about human life. Yeah. Yeah. So your work's had um, a huge amount of social and intellectual impacts. Um, what does an emancipatory sociology look like in your view? <clears throat> well, you have to start by looking at what sociology is at the moment. And I think it's, um, I don't only think, there is good evidence that it remains a discipline which looks at the world from the position of dominant social groups. <clears throat> Not just men, but white people uh, and other uh, other. <clears throat> dominant majorities, minorities. Uh, so, in order for 
sociology to perform an emancipatory function. Emancipation is leading people out of slavery. Um, it has to reimagine itself. It has to reimagine its aims and its methods, and it has to recover its history. So a lot of the work that I've done in the last 10 years, I've been looking at the history of social science, and I have discovered that most of, most of what we're talking about now has been talked about before, not mm. just in the 70s, but in the 1880s, in the 1890s, in the 18th century. You know, we've been there before. But sociology has a very... It's, uh, kind of amnesia about his own past mm. uh, um, and that is such a shame because you know all these it's a bit like unfunded research all that labor gone to waste you know all these people have done all this work before uh, but for example if you look at the evolution of sociological research methods you know we um, shouted a lot in the 70s and 80s about the discovery of qualitative interviewing and so on. Yeah. Well, they were doing it. They were doing it in the 1890s and the early 1900s. There were uh, many social researchers, mainly women, but not exclusively, who were doing covert ethnography, qualitative interviewing, diaries, formal surveys, the whole lot. No. They didn't necessarily, they did triangulation, they didn't call it that, but that's what they were doing. They said, we had the data from here and the data from here and the data from here, and we looked at it all together. Mm -hmm. So why do we constantly need to uh, reinvent the past? I mean, that is, that's not, that's not emancipation for mm -hmm. anyone. So, I, you know, I think there's a lot of work still to be done. Um, I think universities <laughs> obviously got a lot to answer for. Um, you know, when I started out in all of this, something like 80% of academic staff were men. That's not the case now. But do we actually have a culture which doesn't reflect dominant views about, mm -hmm. not just about masculinity, but dominant views about important social issues? Housework is not an important social issue. Mm -hmm. um, the way men behave is not an important social issue. Uh, uh, how babies are brought up is not an important social issue. No. Yeah? So, but why not? I mean, it has to... I have, well, the other night when I was awake in the middle of the night, as one is as you get older, um, I'm thinking what we really need is we need a degree course which actually takes all these texts from the past. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so it teaches. It doesn't teach, um, you know, Weber, Durkheim and whatever. Well, we look at not Max Weber, but Marianne Weber, who was a very yes. important uh, yeah. sociologist in her own right. Yeah. Um, we, we look at what she did. Um, we look at the Methodist text from the point of view of people like Margaret Harkness, who was a cousin of Beatrice Webb, who did this amazing work uh, studying sweated labour, and also wrote novels. This is yeah. another thing, you know, it's yeah. one of the things that I have done, but it's also something that um, women social researchers and male social researchers in the past did a lot. It wasn't regarded as extraordinary to write the themes that you were interested in in fiction as well as in factual form. Yeah. Um, and, and now, you know, that's not regarded as a, um, a, a sensible thing to do. But why not? Yeah. Why not? If you want to encourage debate, if you want to encourage people to think about something and to do something about it, then why not? Yeah, yeah. That's, and that leads us to our final question which is, um, you know, one of the themes of this interview, of this conversation has been legacy. Um, what do you feel, um, how do you feel that people may take your work forward, how, that, that sort of legacy into the future of, of the work that you've done? I've got absolutely no idea. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hope, I hope that, um, I, I, yeah, I hope that, the, the emphasis on the kind of sociology that I've done, which is attention to uh, the, the living of everyday lives and people's experiences on the one hand, and as I said before, the notion of social science as social science. I hope those two things are the, the things that get remembered and taken forward. But 
I would really like to know what happens, and it's really frustrating <laughs> to know that I won't know. <laughs> okay. Well, um, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for your generosity and your time. It's, it's yeah, been a real learning experience. Yes, it has. It's been and for me too, it's made me think about the past. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.